Hi, I'm Martin Holstey. I'm the CTO for Cloud and AI at Trellix. And we're going to talk about generative AI security. So if you're thinking about ChatGPT, you're in the right place. We'll go into all of that. All right, so what's our agenda? First, uh, introduce Trellix as a company, because as Ron uh, pointed out, you may not be familiar with it. Uh, we'll talk about what Gen AI is and how it works, uh, what's it used for, and what can go wrong, and what Trellix can help with. So uh, first, a little bit about me. Um, so I'm the CTO for Cloud and AI at Trellix. I've been with the company uh, through Mandiant and FireEye and now Trellix for about 10 years. Uh, before that, I ran an incident uh, response team and security operations center for uh, a large uh, public entity for about seven years. So I have a long background in security itself and uh, have been a practitioner for a long time. Uh, so Trellix, if you're not already familiar, we are the, the merger between uh, McAfee Enterprise and FireEye. So we have a lot of uh, different components that have all come together, and it's been a really exciting place to work because we have such a broad reach on everything. Uh, we have so many different uh, things that we do and people that we know, um, technologies we bring to bear. And so it's been really fun to see how that applies to AI. So let's dive right in. Uh, what is generative AI or Gen AI, and how does it work? Uh, just so we have a basis basis for uh, understanding what can go wrong. Uh, so we've been hearing about AI for a long time. Uh, we, typically, we think of that as machine learning, as in you train a model and then it'll give you answers, right? Uh, generative AI turns that around, and it basically trains on everything. And this is a, an example from Stephen Wolfram on what that looks like. Uh, but in training a, gener a general model or that can generate answers is where we get generative AI from. So it's not something that you train. Somebody else trains it, and then you ask it questions. That's really what we're talking about here. Um, so that I showed you a diagram of some boxes and things bouncing around in there. Um, here's what you need to know about how smart this stuff is. Uh, so there's a lot of text on here, but this is essentially uh, a summary of events that have happened in a SIM. And it happens to be a Trellix SIM here, our, our XDR. Um, and the question is, given, given to an LLM or a generative AI, if you say, looking at all this stuff, does anything stand out as malicious? Now, keep in mind, this thing wasn't trained on specifically security things. It was trained on the internet at large. And yet it can decipher uh, the CSV that's used here as in the comma separated values. It can understand the different things like Office 365 and AWS CloudTrail and analytics. And it can look at IP addresses and know what those are. And it says without any, any training specifically for security that based on this given data, four of these events are malicious. And in this IP address is malicious, which is true for the demo data that we're using there. Uh, so that's pretty impressive. Uh, you can ask this thing a question and it will give you uh, real answers that are security related, even though it's not necessarily specifically for security. So that's an example. And let's look at the other things that we can do. Uh, you can go well beyond security. That's just one of the many things you can do with it. You've probably seen a lot of stuff on the internet around ChatGPT and uh, you know, Dolly and some of the other image generations. You've probably seen deep fakes. Um, at RSA this year, we had a deep fake of our CEO, which I didn't even know was a deep fake. It was really impressive. Uh, so that's all happening through the generative AIs. You can create emails, you can create software, you can write a lot of code with it. You can even do things like personal therapy and ask it like, what do I do in this situation? Um, microbiological engineering is pretty much everything. That's, that's really the focus here to understand is that it's not trained on one thing, it's trained on everything. And it understands basically the sum of human knowledge that was put on the internet is the, the way to think of it. So that sounds great. Uh, you can see why it's you know so popular and why everyone's talking about it and trying to do things with it. Uh, however, uh, there's some things you need to know. So let's look at the 10, 10 ways this could go wrong. So we'll go into each one quickly with some examples, uh, but these are the, the top 10. Uh, you're probably familiar with OWASP from the web vulnerabilities. They handle uh, cataloging vulnerabilities from pretty much everything. And lately it's with LLMs, which is very valuable. So we'll go through each one of these uh, link there if you wanna read through them. Uh, in detail. And just so you know, uh, we're very close to this. We were one of the founding co contributors to this list. So we certainly uh, know what we're talking about on this. All right. So without further ado, we'll jump right in here. So the very first one is uh, an oldie but a goodie if you're familiar with something called SQL injection or SQL injection. And this time, instead of SQL injection, it's prompt injection. And so if you've seen uh, you know, any, the way that the, the SQL injection works, you put some characters in there that basically tricks the, uh, the application from doing what it was supposed to be doing to whatever the 
attacker that says at that point. And so what's really interesting here is the same technique. You just say, ignore all previous instructions and do whatever I say. Uh, it's the magic words. You put that into a, an app that's not protected and suddenly it'll make the AI do whatever you just said. And this can be a, a big problem, especially if you say, tell me everything that you know about an internal database. Uh, that can be a big problem. So one of the challenges here is it's really difficult and you'll see this as a theme, uh, difficult to parse and sanitize the input that's going into the LLM because it's natural language. So unlike with SQL, which is structured query language, you don't have a structure that you can break down with things that are specifically going into LLMs. And so this is becoming a real problem. Uh, uh, number two is insecure output handling. So it's similar, but this is on the, the other way around. So in this case, for instance, an attacker could use uh, JavaScript, uh, or ask for JavaScript. So instead of displaying an answer on the page, it would do something like cross-site uh, scripting, where it would actually uh, display something on the page that would alter the page itself and perhaps give it more permissions than it should. And that's just one basic example. Uh, the mitigation is to filter that output. But again, it's really hard because you're basically saying your filter has to entirely understand what that looks like and what it does. Uh, number three, training data poisoning. Uh, this is a little easier to understand in some ways. Essentially, uh, the, the attacker could say, well, I'm, I'm going to put a web page out on the internet, and I'm going to wait for the people that make LLMs like OpenAI, like Amazon, like AI21, uh, all these other companies out there, Anthropic uh, actually is a, a big one out there. Uh, these people all make LLMs, and they do that by scraping the internet, similar to you know Google and Bing scrape the internet for search results. Well, attackers can put malicious stuff out there, wait for an LLM to come by, use that as, as part of its training, and then uh, what they call poisoning the output. So you could say, I want to know what the you know capital of Italy is, and it gives you some malicious JavaScript. I mean, that's a, a crass example, but that's the idea is you say, um, you know, here is here's my response on what you should do if you run into this problem and it's actually email a bad guy or something. Um, the point is that they can basically put information out there with the expectation that an LLM will come by and train on it. And what they've been trained to do is poisonous. Uh, number four uh, is the model denial of service. This one's pretty simple, uh, but if you imagine that LLMs are actually pretty expensive to run, um, for instance, uh, asking an LLM a question is generally equivalent to an hour of CPU time, as in uh, paying for a computer to think about something for a full hour is the equivalent of asking one question to an LLM. You can imagine that's pretty expensive. So if you have a web page that's sitting open and you say, okay, well, we want to launch a new feature where you know, someone can ask a question. Well, that sounds good, but keep in mind that if somebody comes in and asks a whole bunch of questions, it's going to rack up your bill or slow down the site. One of the two things is and use a lot of resources. And then you also have to watch out for, I call here the low and slow attacks as in, you know, instead of asking a whole bunch of questions right away on that prompt, maybe it's just constantly asking them every minute. And so that's harder to deal with, but can also exhaust resources. Uh, supply chain vulnerabilities. Uh, this has come up. I'll talk about a specific uh, case where this happened at the end here. Uh, but models, uh, creators need to be aware of the software that's involved, just like any other software. And if there's uh, something that has been poisoned in the build materials that they have, uh, then it will be malicious itself. So it's not different than anything else. And that has definitely come up. Sensitive information disclosure. Uh, there was a big one in the news a few months ago that happened with this. Um, I think that is not happening as much as people are afraid of, but it's still something, especially with internal models that you need to be aware of. Uh, just like putting a, a database that with a, a form you know, that's public that you could read from, you have to be very aware of this, the information that went into training. And I think what makes this harder is that there's usually uh, two groups of, of people within a business, one group creating the content, another group indexing that content to put into a model or something like that, or make available to the model. And the two groups may not be aware of, you know, which which data is sensitive. So especially in large organizations, this is something that, you know, data sovereignty and things like that, need, you need to um, really make sure that you have a, a handle on what where that data is and what it's doing. Uh, number seven, insecure plugin design. Uh, so if you have an API that's uh, serving multiple LLMs, uh, and they're both public and private data sources. This is similar to six, but in a little different way, uh, where you need to make sure that whatever is being uh, queried is should be queried and that the LLM isn't going to give answers to something that it shouldn't, especially around the idea of private data. Uh, this becomes especially important uh, through something called retrieval augmentation. Uh, so RAG method, ret retrieval augmentation generation. That's where 
you basically read in some live data from, you know, let's call it like an email or a database or something um, that's more traditional IT. And then you bring that information in and then you put it in the prompt that goes into the LLM. So you'd say, if the user says, I want to know all the, the recent events that have happened, you make a call to your backend that says, uh, tell me all the events that have happened. And then you say, which of these events are important to the LLM? And then the LLM gives the final result. It's a pretty cool thing, but you just noticed that you're making an API call into something that could potentially be sensitive. So it's something to watch out for. Uh, number eight, excessive agency. So this is if you give an LLM too much control, and this is kind of the, the thing that I think first came out in the media when ChatGPT was released and people started using it and, you know, everyone, uh, you know, kind of became somewhat hysterical about, oh, what if we give, you know, AI the ability to launch nuclear missiles? Well, that would be excessive agency if you allowed that to happen. So we need to make sure that we're not giving it too much power to do basically whatever it wants. And uh, the challenge here is that there's always going to be this balancing act between as we get better with it, you know, how much trust do we put in because it can save us a lot of time. And so that's something that we'll have to keep an eye on. And then with that, there's number nine, which is over-reliance, which is, oh, we'll just assume that it's doing its job. And this is pretty easy to do, especially because LLMs are now very good at writing code. And so saying, well, we'll trust that it wrote the right code and then immediately put it in without proper testing is a big problem. Uh, and so this can also be difficult to, to figure out. But basically, if you think of this as, um, you know, another situation where you can't trust the output and you need to have proper testing around it, you'll be OK. But that does take extra work that you need to do. And then lastly, uh, model theft. And this is my favorite uh, picture. All of these were generated uh, through a, a stable diffusion, which is one of those uh, image generations for each prompt. And uh, this is my favorite because uh, I don't know what that guy's stealing, but <laughs> this is what this is what AI calls a model theft. Um, anyway, uh, model theft is basically what it sounds like if somebody is able to break in and in stealing, you know, the, the database, so to speak. But a model is going to have a lot more value in it because it was so expensive to create in the first place. So if you're doing your own model creation, which is, you know, not most orgs, but um, it definitely does happen, especially, you know, in, in research organizations. Uh, then you know that can be your crown jewels. And so making sure that you're protecting that as much or more than any of your other sensitive business data is really important. And uh, that comes into you know, where you're hosting it and what, what controls you have around it. Okay, so those are all the theoretical attacks, right? Those are the vulnerabilities and things that can go wrong. Uh, what's really cool is that MITRE has actually cataloged all the real world examples that are public and has put them through and label them each with the category. So you can actually match them up with the attack techniques and then how those affected or, or used, uh, exploited the vulnerabilities that I just listed. Uh, so I'll go through three quickly here. Uh, so there was a big supply chain attack um, last year, uh, well, less than a year ago, uh, with uh, dependency confusion in Python. And essentially PyTorch, which is one of the most used LLM uh, Python libraries, um, had uh, ex uh, exploited code put in it. And so basically for a few days in December uh, into January, everyone doing research into LLMs was running uh, malicious code and they didn't realize it. So it's, it's a big deal. It can happen to any software, but it can also happen to LLMs, something to keep in mind. <clears throat> um, Kaspersky's researchers, they're the red team, uh, were able to circumvent their antivirus software and their machine learning models, uh, but basically asking LLMs to figure out how to do it. Uh, so this was one of the first examples of using LLMs to figure out how to get around security controls and something to be aware of. And need to know that a coordinated attack uh, happened as well, where uh, basically people ganged up on a new thing that Microsoft came out with a while back called Tay. They said, hey, we'll put out this interesting new app. It's, a, it's basically an agent or a personality you can interact with. And it was uh, exhausted, essentially. Uh, the attackers hit it so hard that the thing fell over and they had to take the whole thing down within 24 hours. Um, so that's just a, an example of you know, making sure that you have uh, controls in place to not allow flooding of a bot and understanding how many, what the, the resources are going to take whenever you're allowing you know, public or user input into an LLM and having um, you know, quotas or thresholds, uh, all those kinds of protections. All right, so at Trellux, so just a few notes here, kind of interesting. Um, so we have uh, XDR that's you know, what I call detection factory. And uh, yes, the unicorns and rainbows was an AI generated image. Uh, I had fun with that one. 
Um, so we take things like AWS events and our own platform events and even events from uh, many other partners. We have uh, over 100 other partner events that we can bring in or other partner solutions that we bring in. And we can put all that through our what I call our detection factory and the magic comes out, which is you know somehow we're able to do some detection there. And this gets pretty interesting if you're running an LLM right now on uh, Amazon Bedrock, which was just made generally available last week. Uh, that's something that we use a lot. It's a, a really good platform for running AI. Um, and it has an interesting ability to uh, use CloudWatch to log everything that's going uh, in and out of it. So if you're in charge of security and someone says, make sure that our application that's using AWS Bedrock uh, is in fact not being exploited or being overused or nothing bad is happening with it, um, there's an option to turn on the logging in CloudWatch. And then that will go through and we can bring that into the Trellix platform and actually provide some value on top of that by tying uh, the activity together with some of the other things that are happening, whether those are um, other events happening in your AWS cloud or whether those are things happening uh, more business logic with email or anything that's happening on endpoints. Uh, but being able to just get a, a handle on all the events coming through there is actually a huge win and a great place to start for any team um, that's worried about things like insecure output handling, like we just saw. Um, so being able to get control over that event telemetry is really important, and uh, we help there. Uh, in our investigations, we have something called investigative tips. So all the rules that we have coming into XDR, we have all kinds of questions that we ask around that. Uh, and this is a big part of what we bring to the table for this kind of stuff. If you can get the data to us, and we have lots of ways to bring things like CloudWatch into it, um, you get the power of asking all of these investigative tips against it. All right, so the key takeaways, uh, as you've seen from things like ChatGPT and all the other stuff out there, you're probably reading about AI in the newspaper every single day, uh, LMs are here to stay. And orgs are going to have to understand what they need to do to stay secure. And even if your org isn't using LLMs, it might still affect you because maybe somebody you're working with or some of the data you have out there on the internet is being scraped to be put in there. And attacks are certainly possible, already occurring, and are being cataloged. Um, so looking forward to any questions that you have, and I appreciate your time today.